Welcome back everyone to the Algebra Graph Theory Seminar. This week we have our own Tina Chen giving a talk on periodicity of bipartite walks. Okay, so today I'm going to talk about periodicity of bipartite walks on certain graphs and its connections to the periodicity of Grover's walk. Okay, so... Uh, okay, so as many of you know that the Grover's walk is a model of discrete quantum work. And actually, bipartite work is also a model of discrete quantum work. And for the purpose of today's talk, all you need to know about discrete quantum work is that a discrete quantum work is determined by a new integer matrix U, which we call the transition matrix of the work. And usually, we will use a density matrix to denote the initial state of the quantum system. So a density matrix is just a positive semi-definite matrix with trace one. And if you start at this uh, state D, then at the K steps, you'll be at the state D of K. It'll be like this. And the studies of discrete quantum works are largely motivated by the search problem. And among those, one of the most famous uh, algorithm is Grover's algorithm. So Grover show that an implementation of this setup can be used to enable quantum computers to do search a database faster than any known classical algorithm. And one of subject today, the uh, Grover's work um, can be used to implement this Grover's algorithm. So if you just define this Grover's work over a complete graph with self loops, then it can be used to um, implement this Grover's algorithm. Okay, so first, uh, I want to show you guys what is bipartite walks. So to define a bipartite walks, we need a bipartite graph. So given a bipartite graph, you have two color class, C0 and C1. And so we can partition our edges in two different ways according to your two color classes. So we say if two edges are in the same cell in your partition pi zero, if they have the same end in your um, color class C zero. So you can see that uh, the two edge I mark with green triangles, those two will be in the same cell of your partition pi zero. And similarly, we can say if two, uh, we can define another partition pi one. So if edges have the same end in the color class C1, then they will be in the same cell of your color uh, of your partition pi one. So you can see those three edges I mark with green uh, pink squares, those will be in the same cell in your partition pi one. Okay, so now we have two partitions, pi zero and pi one. Now we can define two characteristic matrices uh, for your pi zero and pi one respectively call them P0 and P1. So P0 and P1 its rows are going to be indexed by the edges of your bipartite graph and its columns are going to index by the cells of your partitions pi0 and pi1. So next steps, we are going to uh, normalize them. So what do I mean when I say normalize? So I basically just mean uh, we're going to scale each columns into a unit vector. So now we have normalized P, um, P0 and P1. And using this normalized P0 and P1, we're going to define two projections, P and Q. So you can see this P and Q are going to be constant on the cells of its corresponding partitions. So you can see here, um, this P will be constant on cells of your partition pi zero, and this Q will be constant on cells of your partition pi one. Okay, so since P and Q are two uh, projections, this two P minus I and two Q minus I will be two reflections. And we take the product of these two reflections to be the transition matrix of your bipartite work. And this will be a transition matrix of the bipartite walk on the uh, bipartite graph I just showed you before. So one thing to keep in mind that is those uh, rows and columns of this transition matrix are indexed by the edges of your bipartite graph. Okay, so far, so any question about the definition of bipartite walks?
Okay, since we now we know what is bipolar works, I'm going to show you that why today I'm going to focus on bipolar works defined over biregular graphs. Because uh, if the graph is biregular, the spectrum of this transition matrix is going to be determined by the spectrum of your underlying graph. So uh, for those who are familiar with continuous work, you will see like this actually is not less surprising in continuous case, because in continuous case, the Hamiltonians of your work is the adjacency matrix of your underlying graph. So in that case, of course, the spectrum of your transition matrix is going to be determined by the spectrum of your uh, graph. But in discrete case, um, in general, the Hamiltonian of your discrete work has no direct connection uh, with your underlying graph. But in, in a case when the graph is biregular, actually, I'm going to show you the spectrum of your transition matrix is determined by the spectrum of the graph. But first, we need a new matrix C. So C is going to be defined as C1, um, P1 transpose P0. And this P1 and P0s are the projections I just showed before. And this will be the matrix C of the bipartite graph I showed before. And this will be our normalized C. So in harmonies, um, PG synthesis should show that the actually the spectrum of your transition matrix is always going to be determined by the spectrum of your uh, normalized CC transpose. So, uh, which means like every eigenvalue e to the i theta of your transition matrix U is going to be uh, to mu r minus one. And then this mu is the eigenvalue of your normalized CC transpose. Okay, and since how uh, since our graph is by um, bipartite, so you know the adjacency matrix of this bipartite graph will always have this blocked uh, matrix form. And just because how we define our matrix C, you can see that uh, the adjacency matrix of your underlying graph can be written in terms of this matrix C. And this is just an example of the bipartite graph I showed you before. So you can see that uh, if we take the square of your adjacency matrix, the spectrum of this A square just give you two copies of the spectrum of your CC transpose. And when the graph is biregular, then this CC transpose just a scalar multiple of your normalized CC transpose. Okay, so since we know this, uh, the transition and the spectrum of your transition matrix U is always going to be determined by the spectrum of this CC uh, normalized CC transpose. And when the, I and I just show you that when the graph is biregular, when uh, when the graph is biregular, the spectrum of your adjacency matrix determine the spectrum of your normalized CC transpose. So we have that uh, when the graph is biregular, then the spectrum of your transition matrix is going to be determined by the spectrum of your underlying graph. That is, every eigenvalue e to the i theta r is going to satisfy that cosine theta r can be written in terms of this, uh, which here the lambda is an eigenvalue of your uh, eigenvalue of your adjacency matrix of your underlying graph. Okay, so now we're going to move on the periodicity of bipartite walks. Okay, so in our case, we uh, we use EA, EA transpose to be our um, to be our state. So where this EA is just the standard basis. So you have one in the A centuries and zero otherwise. So you can see this DA is associated with an edge of your bipartite graphs. And actually this definition like suits us perfectly because remember the rows and columns of your transition matrix are going to be indexed by the edges of your graph. And we say if a worker start at the state DA and then, and then at the case steps, 
the worker will be at da of k, will be in this state. And then we say if a state is periodic, if and only if there exists a positive integer tau, such that uh, after tau steps, it goes back to yourself. Okay, so before I give you a characterization of a periodic state, I'm going to introduce a new term called the eigenvalue support. So an uh, eigenvalue support of a state D is just a pair of eigenvalues such that its corresponding, um, corresponding spectral idempotence satisfy that the ER D ES is not zero. And in that case, we say if a state is periodic, if and only if, all the eigenvalue in its eigenvalue support is the rational multiple of pi. Okay, so to see that, we first we just use the definition of a state being periodic. So uh, this equation is just the definition about uh, the definition of a periodic state, and this is we are getting this uh, this term as just using the spectral decomposition of U. But on the other hand, we also know that the sum of your uh, spectral isopotent is identity. So you can also write the A in terms of this form. So right now we have two different ways to write uh, the A. And then we just compare those two different ways. We know that for every pair of eigenvalues in the eigenvalue support of the A, it must satisfy this equation, right? And since uh, e, uh, theta r and minus theta r is always those, uh, so a pair of eigenvalues that are algebraic, con uh, algebraic conjugate of each other, they will be always be your eigen will be in the same eigenvalue support. So you can you know that you can actually take this theta s to be minus theta r. So in that case, we will have this last equation here. Okay, and just based on how we define this DA, DA is EA EA transpose. So we know this term, this matrix is actually real. So this matrix is real and this also a real matrix. So you know this two tau theta ri give, it has to be one. So which implies this two tau theta r is the integer multiple of two pi. So you know this theta r is a rational multiple of pi. Okay. So now we have shown that uh, if a state is periodic, if and only if, for every pair of its eigenvalues, uh, every pair of its eigenvalue in its eigenvalue support must be a rational multiple of pi. But today, actually, we are going to talk about a more like rare phenomenon that is periodic walks. So it just means a periodic walk, it just means uh, every state of your walk is periodic. So there must be a um, positive integer k such that u to the k give you identity. In that case, we call the walk is periodic, and the smallest such k is the period of your walk. Okay, so now I'm going to give you a very useful uh, necessary condition. That is, if a walk is periodic, then the two cosine k theta r must be an algebraic integer for any non-negative integer k. To see that, uh, we just use the definition of periodic walks. So if t is the uh, period of your walk, then we know u to the t give you identity. So you know every eigenvalue of your transition matrix must be a root of this xt uh, minus one. And this tells us the a every eigenvalue e to the i theta r is an algebraic integer. And since the product of algebraic integers are algebraic integer, and the sum of algebraic integers are still algebraic integers. So we know this two cosine k theta r is an algebraic integer. And why I say it's a very useful condition, that is because I'm going to show you, just using that condition, it gives us a very quick way to check if a bipartite walk is periodic or not. So if a walk is periodic, then the trace of u to decay must be integer. 
for any uh for any integer k. Okay, so to see that actually uh we just need to know that uh, based on how we define our U transition matrix U, so you know uh, U is a rational matrix. So you know the trace of U to decay is always so rational. But on the other hand, you can also write uh, the trace of U to decay as a sum of two cosine k zeta r. And just like I showed before, this two, cos uh, two cosine k zeta r is an algebraic integer. So you know the trace of this u to decay is also an algebraic integer, but it's all, but it it is also rational, so it has to be an integer. So we show that if a, a walk is periodic, then the trace of u to decay must be an integer. And here is the transition matrix of the bipartite walk I just showed you before. So you can see this walk cannot be periodic because the trace of this u is minus one over three. So it is not an integer, so it cannot be periodic. Okay, so a quick recap. So uh, first, we know we show that if a state is periodic, then all its eigenvalue and its eigenvalue support must be a rational multiple of pi. And we also show that if a walk is periodic, then the two cosine k zeta r must be an algebraic integer for any non-negative integer k. So we see if the um, graph is periodic, then all its eigenvalue must satisfy that. So first, this two cosine zeta r must be an algebraic integer. And since the graph is what well, uh, the graph is biregular, we know this can also be written in terms of the spectrum of your uh, of your graph. And on the other hand, we also know when the graph is periodic, it means every state is periodic. So we know that uh, all the eigenvalue must satisfy that it has to be of the form that is a rational multiple of pi. Okay, so just using those, I'm going to show you this um, characterization of periodicity of bipartite walks on biregular graphs. So if we um, define bipartite walk on our biregular graph, and we assume that the square of your spectrums are algebraic integer with degree at most two, then we know uh, the graph is periodic if and only if every eigenvalue of your um, underlying graph must satisfy that if the, the square of the eigenvalue is an algebraic integer of degree one, then it must be like one of those five values. On the other hand, if it's an algebraic integer of degree two, then it must take in one of those eight values. Okay. So one nice thing about this characterization is that once we know or uh, once we know the graph uh the walk is periodic, then we know what the eigenvalue has to be. And these eigenvalues are determined by the degree of your underlying graph. Okay. So to show uh this characterizations we just need to use some theory from algebra, uh, some results from algebraic number theory. So first, since we assume the square of your uh, eigenvalues are algebraic integer with degree at most two. So we just use this standard result from the algebraic integer, uh, algebraic number theory. So we know the square of your eigenvalues can be written as a plus b square root of mr, where this mr is a square-free integer, and this a and b are rationals. Okay. And then there's another result we can use from algebraic number theory. So what this result says is that uh, given a cosine theta, if this theta is a rational multiple of pi, then 
uh, let's co to cosine theta as an algebraic integer of degree one, if and only if uh, the cosine theta have one of those three values. So it's either one, zero, or in half. Or if uh, let's two cosine theta is an algebraic integer of degree two, then this cosine theta must be one of those four values. Okay. And since we have shown that if a graph is periodic, then every eigenvalue of uh, eigenvalue e to the i theta r must satisfy that this two cosine theta r is an algebraic integer of degree at most two. And this theta r must be a rational multiple of pi. And because of these two conditions, we know we can use the algebraic number theory result I just showed you before. So we know if a graph is periodic, if and only if, uh, when, if it's an algebraic integer of degree one, then this cosine theta r must be one of those five values. And if it's an algebraic integer of degree two, then it must take in one of those eight values. Okay, so now I just um, take one case for an example, just to give you an idea how we do all the other cases. So in here, we just consider the case when cosine theta to be in half. So when the cosine theta r uh, is in half, because our graph is by record, then we know this cosine theta r also can be written in terms of the spectrum of your underlying graph. So in this case, we know that this uh, square lambda is just three quarter of d zero d one. And on the other hand, when we take this cosine theta r um, cosine theta to be minus half, then in that case, the square of your lambda has to be a quarter of d zero d one. And then just use this same idea for every other classes. Uh, so we can get a periodicity characterization of by part of works on by regular graphs. Okay, so the graph is by regular, and if we assume the square of eigenvalues are algebraic integer with degree at most two, then the work is periodic if and only if the square of its eigenvalue is an algebraic integer of degree one, then it's one of those five values. And if an algebraic integer of degree two, then it's one of those eight values. And you can see that uh, the degree of your degree of your underlying graph actually determines the spectrum, the spectrum of your transition matrix here when the work is periodic. Okay, so now we are going to move on to the periodicity of Grover's work. So um, actually here is the result from like one of Shokubra's paper. Uh, in that paper, he studies the periodicities of Grover's work defined over um, k regular by partite graph with at most five eigenvalues. And the reason why I started to study the periodicity of bipartite work is because when I read his paper uh, about the periodicity of Grover's work, and I think, okay, since the Grover's work is a special case of bipartite work, so if we know, we, if we can know anything about the periodicity of bipartite works, then probably we can extend this result of the periodicity of Grover's work. And indeed, actually, the result I just showed you before about periodicity of bipartite work actually extend the result, uh, extend this result of periodicity of Grover's work. Okay, 
Okay, but first I'm going to show you why Grover's walk is a special case of bipartite walks. Okay, so first, uh, what is a Grover's walk? Grover's walk is defined over a directed graph. So for any graph, you just give its edge two different directions, you get a directed graph. And here is some things we need to define before we define the transition matrix for our Grover's walk. So first, uh, given arc from X to Y, we call X to be the head of your arc and then Y to be the tail of your arc. If alpha is an arc from X to Y, then we say alpha uh, inverse is an arc from Y to X. And we also need to uh, define a new matrix called uh, tail arc incidence matrix D. So the rows of your D will be indexed by the vertices of your directed graph and the columns will be indexed by the arcs of your directed graph. And then the X alpha, uh, if X is in tail of your alpha, then X alpha entry will take the value one over square root of degree of, uh, one over square root of degree of X and zero otherwise. Okay, so here is just show you an uh, example what's this D going to be uh, like. So this is the D star matrix for this directed graph. So we can see here on um, zero is the tail of this arc two zero. And since on the underlying graph, the zero have degree three, so we can see uh, this entry will take the value one over square root of three. Okay, since now we know what is D and now, so we know this D star D will be a matrix that is rows and columns uh, indexed by the arcs of your directed graph. And if alpha beta two arcs will sh share a same tail, then the alpha beta entries of your D star D will have the value of one over the degree of this shared tail and zero otherwise. And this will be the D star D of the directed graph here. I just, the same directed graph I showed you before. Okay. So another matrix we need is called the arc reversal matrix. So just like its name suggests, uh, it reverses an arc. So if you give an arc um, from X to Y, if you give this arc to your arc reversal matrix, it gives back an arc from Y to X. So you can see here, actually, uh, arc, uh, this is an arc reversal matrix of this directed graph. Okay, and so you can see it's actually just a zero one matrix. And the transition matrix of your Grover's work defined over graph G will be the product of this arc reversal matrix and to D star D minus identity. And this will be the uh, transition matrix of the Grover's work of the directed graph. I just keep showing you guys. Okay. And now I'm going to show you that how the uh, Grover's walk is the special case of your bipartite walk. And to show that, I want to define a new graph that is a subdivision graph. So given any graph G, if you just put a new vertex in each of its edges, you the resulting graph is what we call a subdivision graph. Okay, so a few a few things to keep in mind here. So first, the subdivision graph is always a bipartite graph. And you can see here, all the newly added vertex will always have degree two. And the old vertex here will preserve its degree in its original graph. Okay, and I keep saying that the Grover's work is a special case of bipartite works, but what do I mean when I say it's a special case? 
So what do I mean here is that given any graph G, the transition matrix of your grower's work defined over this G is exact the same as the transition matrix of the bipartite works defined on the subdivision graph of UG. Okay, so to see that, I want to show you a connection between the subdivision graph and the directed graph. So remember, like when we def to when we construct our uh, directed graph, so basically we're just given any edge is two directions, then we create two arcs. So for example, we just give the edge to zero, two directions, then we get an arc from zero to two, and then we get an arc another arc from two to zero. And now think about how we construct our subdivision graph. So for every subdivision, um, to construct our subdivision graph, so basically we just put a vertex in, in one of each edges. So if we just put a vertex A in the edge to zero, then we get two edges in the subdivision graph, A0 and A2. So we can assign this edge A0 to the arc like, uh, from two to zero and the edge uh, A2 to the arc from zero to two. So you can see actually there's a connection between the edge of uh, subdivision graph and the arcs of your directed graph. Okay, so just use these uh, connections. I want to show you that the projections we define all uh, projection we define over this color class of your subdivision graph when we define your bipartite work is exactly the same as the DSRD when you define the Grover's work on this, uh, on this directed graph. Okay, so just um, a reminder, like what's the, ent uh, what's the en entry value of your DSRD? So we say if two arcs share the same tail, then those arcs, uh, the corresponding entries of those arcs in your D star D will have the value of one over degree of this shared tail. So you can see those three arcs share the same tail like zero. Use the connection I just showed before, these three uh, arcs will corresponding to the three edges that's coming out of uh, this vertex zero, right? And this three uh, three edges will be in the same cell of this partition. So just use this correspondence. Actually, it's not very hard to see that the projections on this color class will give you the matrix D30. And another matrix we need to deal with is the arc reversal matrix. And for the arc reversal matrix, I'm going to show you that the reflections on this newly added vertex um, class, this reflections will give you exact the arc reversal matrix. So, uh, to see that, just keep in mind that the newly added vertex will always have degree two. So uh, this actually is the reflections of your, uh, it's the reflections on this color class when you define the um, bipartite works on the subdivision graph. So you can see here, um, A0, A1 will have entry one. So basically if you give it uh, an edge A1, then it will give you back an R um and give you back an edge. You know, if you give an edge uh this a this entry, so basically it just shows if you give an edge a zero, if you it give you an mm, yeah, it give if give you an edge from a one. So you can see here just use the correspondence I showed before, this a zero get mapped to a one. So we also know that this edge A0 corresponding to an arc from two to zero, and this A1 corresponding to an arc from zero to two. So you can see it's exactly arc reversal matrix when we define the uh, when we define the Grover's work on the directed graph. 
Okay, so now we have shown that the reflections on the subdivision graph is exactly the same as the arc reversal matrix of your Grover's walk. And the projections on one of the color class give you D star D of your, arc, uh, of your Grover's walk. So just use those two. Now you can actually see that actually the transition matrix of bicortile walks on the subdivision graph is exact the same as the transition matrix of the Grover's walk on the directed graph. Okay, so now I'm going to show you actually like one steps of your bipartite walks gives you two steps of your Grover's walk. Okay, so to see that since I already show you that the Grover's walk on a graph is the same as the bipartite walks defined over a subdivision graph. So now here I'm just going to show you a connection between the subdivision graph and its original graph. So we can see like when you define the projections on your subdivision graph on this color class, and this zero one actually belong to the same color class of your original graph G, and this three, two, three, four vertex are going to be the other color class of your original graph G. So you can see the color class of your subdivision, this color class of your subdivision graph just consists of both color classes of your original graph G. And just use that, you can see the projections on this part of uh, vertices can be written as a direct sum of the projections of your original graph. So this will be a projections on this color class and this part will be the projections of this color class of your original graph G. And just use that, and since the arc reversal matrix basically just switch the position of the arcs, so so you can see the transition matrix of your Grover's walk have less um, blocks matrix form, and then its off diagonals will be two reflections of your uh, two reflections of your of the bipartite walks on the original graph G. So in that case, if you just think about the second step steps you take. And the second steps of your Grover's walk will be the direct sum of your um, direct sum of your transition matrix of your bipartite walks. Okay. okay here's just an example. So if you define the bipartite uh, Grover's walk over this graph, and this is the second steps of your Grover's walk. And you can see the second step of this Grover's walk actually can be written as the direct sum of your bipartite walks on its original graph. Okay, so in this case, in, uh, in a case when the graph is biregular, you can uh, define two different uh, models, discrete quantum walk model on your graph G. So you can either define a Grover's walk or you can define bipartite walk. And in that case, for any non-negative integer K, actually every two K steps of your Grover's walk can be written as the direct sum of your K steps of your bipartite walk. Okay, so now we are going to talk about periodicity of Grover's walk. And since we, I just show you that every two K steps of your Grover's walk is, third, uh, is a direct sum of your K steps of your bipartite walk. So we know when the graph, uh, uh, when Grover's walk is periodic with period two K, F and only F, the bipartite walks is also, peri uh, is also periodic with period K. So you can see here, bipartite walks actually reach its periodic states, only use half of the time for the Grover's walks to reach its periodic state. Another thing we can know from that theorem is that the, periodic, uh, the period of a periodic Grover's walk has to be even. Because for any uh, 
odd positive integer k, uh, integer i, the i steps of your growers will, it will have this um, block matrix form. And you can see here, the diagonal will always be zero. So in that case, you know that uh, it can never be identity matrix. So the walk, the case, uh, the odd steps of your walks cannot be periodic. So if the walk is periodic, then the period has to be even. Okay. So now I'm going to show you how we use the characterizations of periodicity of bipartite walks to give our characterizations of periodicity of Grover's walk. Since we use the subdivision graph to build a connection between the bipartite walks and the um, Grover's walk. So now I'm going to show you the spectrum of your underlying graphs determining the spectrum of your subdivision graph when the graph is regular. So first, here is just the standard result from algebraic number theory. That is, uh, when the graph is regular, the spectrum of the graph determines the spectrum of its line graph. And this second lemma here says the spectrum of your line graph determines the spectrum of your uh, subdivision graph. OK, so just use those two, we can actually show that when the graph is regular, the spectrum of your graph determines the spectrum of your uh, subdivision graph. So if lambda is the eigenvalue of your g, if and only if plus minus square root of this lambda plus d is the eigenvalue of your subdivision graph. Okay. So just use this, we can actually get a periodicity condition for the Grover's walk on the regular graphs. So we say when the graph is regular, and then we assume the eigenvalues are the algebraic integers of degree at most two, then the walk uh, is periodic if and only if the eigenvalue, if if the eigenvalue is the algebraic integer of degree one, then it has to be one of those five values. And if, an if it is an algebraic integer of degree two, then it must take one of those eight values. And this result just because we assume the graph is regular, so we know there's a connection between the spectrum of your graph and the spectrum of the subdivision graph. And we use this subdivision graph to build a connection between the um, Grover's walk and the Grover's walk and bipartite walks. So we can apply the periodicity condition of bipartite walks I just showed before directly. So to get a result of periodicity of Grover's walk. Okay. So I said before that this result actually extends the result of Shaw Kubitas. So in Shaw Kubitas' paper, he focused on the graph to be a bipartite k regular graph. But in our case, we only require this graph to be regular. It doesn't have to be a bipartite. And he, uh, in his paper, he focused on the graph with at most five eigenvalues. So you know like each eigenvalues are algebraic integer with degree at most two. Okay, so you can actually he see here actually the result we get by applying the periodicity condition of bipartite work, the result we get on the Grover's work actually extend the result uh, of short Kubler's. Okay, since I never show you or uh, actually work that is periodic. Now uh, I'm going to show you such work actually exists. So this uh, is a graph G and this is a spectrum. So if we think about the bipartite cover of this graph, so uh, what is a bipartite cover? So basically if, uh, so you just expose each of your vertex into like, uh, explode each edge into this cross form. So you get a um, bipartite cover of your graph. So if we do the same for this graph G, 
you can see the resulting graph is a regular bipartite graph with degree four. And this will be the spectrum of this uh, bipartite cover of your graph G. And if you still remember the periodicity condition for the bipartite works, so you can see here, actually, this spectrum satisfies the condition. So you can see the bipartite works defined over this graph is periodic uh, with, period, um, with period 10. On the other hand, it also satisfies the condition for the Grover's work to be periodic. So this, if you define the Grover's work on the same graph, it also will be periodic and with period 20. So you can see here, actually, the bipartite works reaches periodic state only use like half of the time of your for your Grover's work to reach its periodic state. Okay, so what is our next steps? So here, uh, we restrict our spectrums of the underlying graph to be algebraic integer with degree two, uh, so with degree at most two. So a very natural question to ask is that what if it has degree greater than two? So in that case, we want to know when the graph uh, defined over this x, uh, defined over your graph x is periodic. On the other hand, a more like ambitious goal is that uh, in continuous work, we know there's a very nice um, characterization called racial conditions for the periodicity of continuous work. In that case, uh, if you know the spectrum of your underlying graph, then you know if a graph, uh, a work, a continuous work defined over that graph is periodic uh, or not. Because in continuous case, the, the Hamiltonians of your work is just the adjacency matrix of your graph. So you can see there's a direct connection between the spectrum of your underlying graph and the spectrum of your work. But just like I said before, in the discrete case, like in general, the Hamiltonian of your discrete work has nothing to do with the uh, has nothing to do with the underlying graph. So in that case, we don't know if there's a direct connection between the spectrum of your underlying graph and the spectrum of your uh, the spectrum of the transition matrix of the work. So I think it's going to be hard to get a periodicity characterizations uh, of discrete works that has a very nice form such as like, uh, just like the ratio conditions. But I think if we just throw in more like restrictions on the form of the spectral, uh, of the spectrum of the underlying graph, probably we can get something uh, as, as close as ratio condition we can. But at least I think it's possible to push the result of this uh, spectrum to have algebraic, to be algebraic integer with degree like sage three or greater. Okay, so that's all I want to talk about today. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions for Tina? Um, Tina, uh, what about just one periodic edge, or maybe uh, only the the edges, in, like 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 a subset of edges that be periodic, being the the entire edge set? Uh, with with so just like a few state to be periodic. Oh, just one edge being periodic, for example, like instead of the entire graph being periodic. Then in that case, we all we can know is just the the spectrum is. Uh, let me let me find the slide. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Here we go. So in that case, if we just know like a state is periodic, then all we know about the eigenvalue is eigenvalue support. It's, mm -hmm. it's just they have to be a rational multiple of pi. Mm -hmm. like why here I focus on the whole work to be periodic? That is in that case, we can 
because in that case, every eigenvalue has to be satisfied this condition. So it's easier for me to give a characterization. I see. Yeah. So it's definitely more easier for the work to be periodic in like one certain state than like the whole work to be periodic. But just in terms of giving like um, conditions, actually it's more convenient to consider yes. the whole work to be periodic. Mm -hmm.